Well, hi all. Uh, it's been quite the year, but we have found a way to get to you, and we're going to sing a couple songs, and then we're going to cut to the lesson, um, but we're going to start with Joy to the World. Sing along. <laughs> Yeah. 
quite the year. And right off the bat, I want to say a big thank you to your staff for giving us the idea to make a video, this video, and send it to you, y'all. And I hope you enjoyed those two carols. Uh, it was fun singing and recording, and I hope you were able to sing along. All right, when we last left off, we were in John 6. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 and then walked on the water during that storm. And the people came searching for him the next day. Jesus called them out on why they were actually searching for him. Remember, they desired the, the temporal bread that, that he had uh, provided for them. And they asked him for a sign to prove who he was, like Moses had done with the manna from heaven. Jesus then went on to explain how he was the true manna from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. We ended the lesson with the crowd asking, though not understanding, Jesus to give them this bread always. And it is here that we see the first of seven, seven I am statements in John. I am the bread of life. Ego I me. I am in the Greek is Christ's proclamation of who he is. When Moses asked of the Lord who uh, to say had sent him, God said, I am who I am. And, God, and he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you, uh, sent me to you. Jesus is taking the name of God and applying it to himself. And rightly so. Names in scripture are often current or, or hopeful descriptions of their holders. Esau means hairy, and he was named so because he was hairy. Jacob was na na Jacob's name means seizing by the heel, for when he came out of the womb, he had a hold of uh, Esau's heel. Joshua means Yahweh is salvation, which he firmly held to as he led the Israelites into battle. And, and Jesus is actually a Greek translation of the Aramaic translation of Joshua. So Jesus also means Yahweh is salvation. I am, however, gives us nothing to go on other than that he is only like himself. I am who I am. There is nothing but himself that can de best describe him. Metaphors and similes often can uh, take, try to attempt to make uh, uh, an attempt at his attributes, but will always fall short of fully revealing, for there is nothing like him. That's why we've talked about, like back in John 5, how it was Jesus who came to show us who the Father was. If they have seen Jesus, they have seen the Father, right? It, it, was, it took actually a full person to come and show us how the Father was like, how, who God, who Yahweh is. Uh, that's why he does nothing but what the Father shows him. Right? We went over that a while back and talked about the relationship between the Father and the Son, and how Jesus says on earth he, he does nothing but what, but what the Father shows him. Jesus, after invoking the name of God for himself, then goes on to give a glimpse into his being. He is the bread of life. Like the manna that fell from heaven in Moses' day, so too has Christ come. But unlike the manna which only sustained the lives of the living, Christ has come to bring life to the dead, the spiritually dead. And in, in his is a bread that satisfies the depths that had been left empty when sin had made its dwelling in us. For he says that whoever comes to me shall not hungry, hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It brings life into the spiritual body, knotting sinew and bone together into a new creation. Now, though it satisfies the condition of life uh, without end, that does not mean we will never desire to eat or drink, simply that we won't do so out of spiritual survival. We won't partake of Christ so that our souls won't die again, but so that we, can, we, that we may have life abundant through Christ. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. It is out of pleasure and desire to know our God that we will continue to partake of Christ. Verse 36, But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Now see, the crowd had seen Jesus do miraculous things, right? They had seen him... Um, uh, uh, provide for 5,000 people with 12 loaves and five fishes. They had, they had heard of his, uh, the couple miracles that he had been doing at this point. 
um, they, they had seen and heard enough so that um, they were actually willing to make him their king. But as Jesus says here, they do not believe. They hunger and thirst, but refuse to come or believe. Why? Has Christ failed? If he is the bread of life, but the very ones who see him and walk with him have not partaken of this bread, and as we will see, are actually offended by him, has he not failed? Verse 37, part one, part A. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Why did they hunger and thirst, yet refuse to come or believe? Because they were not given to Christ by the Father, or at least not yet. Does the fact that they have seen the signs and heard his teaching, and yet do not believe, uh, show him to be uns unsuccessful? Well, of course not. Of course not. We see here that instead, Christ's confidence is in his mission. Oh, sorry. We see here that Christ's confidence in his mission is not in his ability with signs, teachings, cookies, and whispering sweet nothings to the peoples, but actually in the Father's power and plan to save all that he desires. Look at the text. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Now, we have to be careful when it comes to the word all in Scripture. We often take it to mean something that the surrounding verses wouldn't let it mean. Here, though, the context lends itself easily to the fact that every person the Father gives, notice that there isn't any room here for those who are given to not come. They will come. Not can come. Not should come. But will come. There is a stake driven here in this verse that nails down the definite promise that those whom the Father gives comes to Jesus. And those that come, they will be saved. Verse 28b through 40, right? Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Those that the Father gives, that gives, comes. And those that come are never cast out, but will be raised up on the last day. This is the promise that our Redeemer has laid out. This is the assurance of our salvation. Our, our salvation is not buried in the backyard where anyone with a shovel can come and steal it. It is not even in our own hands that we may mistakenly sell it or misplace it. Our salvation is in the hands of the one who gave his life for it. Who laid everything aside that he may pay the ultimate price for it. A price that was not demanded of him. Yet one that he gladly paid. Jesus in John chapter 10 verses 28 and 29 says, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Often, verses like these are controversial. However, regardless, this is good news. Christ's success is not in his ability to win souls, but to do the will of the Father. And that will is to lose none that the Father gives him but raise them up on the last day to eternal life. His will is that everyone who eats of the bread of heaven, which are those who look upon and come to the Son, which are those that are given by the Father to the Son, and all those that drink of him, which are those that believe in him, which are all that are given by the Father to the Son, all of these should have eternal life and be raised on the last day, verse 40. So, did he come for you? Has he, as we sing, freed you from Satan's tyranny, from the depths of hell, and given you victory over the grave? Has your heart prepared him room? Does it sing with nature, heaven and nature, joy to the world, for the Lord has come? 
Does joy and peace fill you to know that the Savior reigns? Or are you more like the land in verse 3? Before his blessings flow, sin and sorrows grow. Thorns infest your groundings, and a curse is found throughout you. We are in the Advent season, where we look back at the coming of our Savior out of heaven onto earth as a lowly baby, destined and determined to bring salvation to all that the Father gives him. And we look forward to the time when he will come as a conquering king, destined and determined to bring justice to all those who rejected him and are therefore his enemies. 2020 has brought hurt and loneliness, frustration and desperation, fear and hopelessness. But, O oh church, do not let the current situation destroy your joy. Place your hope, your joy, in Christ and in his promises and strength. He does not waver, nor does he lie. He does not respond to current events, but instead, he commands them. And he who has commanded these current events has also commanded that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called, given, according to his purpose. Your salvation is intact regardless of if your health or if your family or if our government is intact as well. If you have nothing in this life but your salvation, then take heart for you have a treasure that is more precious than anything you have ever been given. Not health nor wealth, neither prosperity nor youth, nor anything this side of eternity is more satisfying than the bread of heaven. So eat of this daily bread. Place your hope and joy in what he has accomplished and not yourself and not this world. If you have found when you're honest with yourself that you're not able to apply these songs or if you have not yet come to Jesus, have yet to believe that he is your savior and the only way you can be right with God, you are not yet without hope. He may be this very moment drawing you to his side. So run to him. Call out to him. Confess that you are a sinner. That all of your good deeds are worthless and only attempts at proving to God that you don't need him. That you desire to no longer be his enemy, but his child. He has promised that if you come and if you believe, you will be saved. And as we approach Christmas, Remember the bread that came down out of heaven to Bethlehem, which, by the way, Bethlehem is called the house of bread because it was, known, it was well known that it produced good bread. And how interesting is it that Bethlehem also produced the bread of heaven? Kind of a cool thing there. And, and, he, and the bread of heaven existed for all of eternity past. And who is God along with the Father and the Spirit like we talked about back in John chapter 1? Who is broken that we may have eternal life? So partake of this bread this season and place your hope, your joy, and your life in his hands and sing. O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here. Until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel.